All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to introduce our next guest, Tom Canfield, a full-time trader since 1999. And we're really going to dive into what it, what's really like be, being a full-time trader and everything associated with that, trading lessons and trading demons. Uh, so, Tom, thank you so much for, for being a part of this. I think this is going to be great. You bet. Thanks for having me, Richard. It's a pretty cool event. Uh, you've had some amazing speakers. Um, I got to listen to David Ryan yesterday, which was a real treat. Um, that guy really knows his stuff. And I, I identified with a lot of different things that he said uh, as a family man and everything. So that was... Uh, that was special to hear that. I've got a few others that I don't want to go back and listen to, but yeah, it's an honor to be part of this thing. It's really cool. Yeah, we're glad to have you. And to kick things off, I know we've got a lot of topics to run through, uh, but to just kind of set the stage, I'd love to dive into a little bit about your background, how you first got interested okay. in this business and uh, kind of your experience and career as well. Okay, uh, where do you want me to start? I, I guess, I mean, I've, I'd always kind of, it's sort of, my grandfather was a stockbroker late in his life. Uh, and he used to like, he would sit and do like point and figure charts and whatever. And, and, and my dad was kind of into it a little bit on the side. And so I always kind of, I was a numbers guy. And so I always was kind of interested in it. And so it was there and around me. Um, then I went to business school and after business school, I, I took a job with a, a investment bank called Kidder Peabody and ended up trading on the, uh, fixed income side. I was, I was involved in a lot of mortgage backed securities. Uh, Kidder had a huge mortgage back department in the uh, early 90s. And uh, so I was there for a couple of years. Uh, but then I was fascinated with the numbers, but I was a salesman. And so I was like there with this inhuman, you know, trader in New York and this inhuman portfolio manager of a savings and loan like this, trying because they can't talk to each other because they're, 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 they're miserable people. And I'm the go between and that exhausted me. Yeah. It was like, I loved the math and I loved the products and all that stuff. But so I ended up leaving finally, um, you know, for a, a variety of reasons. And I started the restaurant, a restaurant business um, called Bagels and Java. Uh, where I was you know, big bagel bakery of, from scratch, bagel bakery and coffee shop kind of concept, kind of like Einstein's yeah. this around the country. And there's, there's tons of them, especially up in New York. But anyway, um, and then I started having kids and the restaurant business and kids didn't mix real well because it's just you're 24 seven and, and it exhausted me. And my dad I guess probably is like a father son. Hey, let's, let's have, let's connect sort of thing. Took me to a Wade cook conference, which I don't know if, I mean, that's, that's olden days. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Wade cook or not, but I mean, he used to put on these seminars about covered calls and um, ringing the register and all of that. And even though that was a complete fail in terms of like, building a fun strategy for investing or whatever. It was fun. It was fun to kind of go through it with my dad, but it gave me the bug. Right. Like it like reignited the bug. And this was, um, I want to say it was either late 96 or early 97. And so as the year as 1997 went along, you know, the internet had finally come along. And so I could do at home on the equity side, what I was doing or working towards in the fixed income side. And so I kind of started playing around with it and started while the restaurant business was going. And the restaurant business was failing because I was spending less time and I was spending more time with, I, got, I had three kids in diapers at once. So it was kind of a, it, it, it was chaos and my wife needed more support and I was burned out from the restaurants. And I was really fascinated by this whole concept of trading. And so I kind of dove in and um, the restaurants actually failed a lot faster than I wanted them to. And so I was sort of forced into full-time trading because it was kind of like, either I got to go get a job or I got to, I got to pull this off. I got to, I, I got to pull this off. And I had, I had a, a little bit of capital and whatnot and got about a 50 grand in capital or something. And so I'm like, all right, here we go. And that's, 
how it started. I would not recommend that path to anyone because I probably started full time before I was ready. And um, so I put $10,000 into a trading account and dude, I blew it up like that. Like I'd been having some success and whatever, but all of a sudden, once I, I, I switched over to full time, it's like the whole emotional profile changes. So any of you out there that are think that are like having good success as a part-time trader, side hustle, whatever, while you still got a full-time job, don't be in a hurry because that shift changes so much of your perspective yeah. that you need years of repetition to be really ingrained and confident in what you're doing because all of a sudden the pressures and the responsibilities and the stresses of, okay, this has to work as opposed to, you know, the thought of playing probabilities is really easy when you got a hundred grand coming in the door from something else. But when all of a sudden that hundred grand has to come out of that trading account probabilities kind of get thrown out the window in your head. You're like, I need this stuff to work, right. which is not the right way to be going in. You're no longer objective is, yeah. is, is a fair way to put it. So that was a, like, that was my, that was my wake up call of just how hard this was going to be. And it probably took me from that point about two to three years to kind of figure things out. I had success and then I'd have failure and I'd back up and, and whatever. And thankfully I started getting better and better. Uh, and I was making progress with my accounts. Um, I had a horrible experience, um, with a stock called Q logic where it, it had earnings. I didn't know it was earnings. I mean, there was all kinds of fundamental things wrong with everything that happened in this trade. But I had grown an account from 50 grand up to about 80 grand. Uh, and I'm rolling and I'm feeling good about myself. And this Q Logic trade came along. And for whatever reason, I'm like, that's way too high. That's way too, it was up like in the low 20% or something like that. And um, I started shorting it. Like I don't short stocks. Why am I shorting this? Right. But then once I committed to the trade, I couldn't let go of it. Could not let go of it. Because I can't be wrong, especially if I'm outside of my, my, my strategy, I'm taking a trade outside of my strategy. I can't be wrong here. And then once you're really wrong, you're like, okay, I just need to get back to even. I just need to get back to even so I can go back to doing what I did. Everybody's been through this. I'm not talking about anything that no one else has experienced, hasn't experienced. But I mean, I dug my heels in and I just kept shorting until the computer said, you can't short anymore. And I took an $80,000 account down to 40,000 in a day. Wow. That was a wake up call. After that, I took it from 40 down to 30 and was like, what am I going to do? Cause I'm taking money out of this account every month to cover expenses. Uh, thankfully back then life was really cheap and um, we didn't do much other than feed babies, baby formula or whatever. Uh, so my, you know, I, I got, I got a lifeline from my old man um, who loaned me a uh, hundred thousand bucks. And it was that accountability that cleaned me up from a lot of my sloppy habits, gunslinging habits, whatever it was, really quickly. And I started to methodically chug along, um, making, making progress every, every single month. And that was probably, you know, part of it was the market also, because I, you know, I was, I was, I really got my education and my bearings in the bear market of 2000 to 2003. Yeah. Like that was, that was my, and, and that experience has stayed with me to this day. 
It shaped who I was as a trader. It taught me everything about how cruel the market can really be. So what we're going through right now, even though there's a lot of traders out there that are super frustrated, you're getting the education of your lifetime. Don't let it pass you by. Soak in what you're experiencing so that you understand what the market is capable on the other side of what it's capable of good. It's capable of some amazing, awesome stuff. And we can capitalize on that and make some great money. But be damn sure that you understand the capability on the other side as well so that you don't get caught in one of these things and let it erode massive amounts of your capital. So anyway, you know, that's that's kind of the quick and dirty of, of how I got started. And it took me, you know, and that lifeline was huge from my dad. So it's something I'll never forget. Yeah. Because once I was having a lot of success and I'd actually taken it and I, in, in, in the course of about 18 months, I doubled it. And then he said, keep it. Changed my life. So as a parent now, that's something that's always stuck with me. My old man bet on me. I bet on my kids. You know, it's just, it's a pretty cool story. And it's something that I've always appreciated about, uh, we all have daddy issues and I have huge ones and certain things we don't like about our parents. But uh, that's one of the things that uh, he did for me that I was always very thankful of. And it, it, uh, it, it had a huge impact on my life. So that's kind of my, my beginning roots. Um, I had somebody come along in the, in the, in the middle of this process who you guys all know very well. And I've, I've been pretty vocal in the past about him being my mentor is Pat Walker who lives 10 minutes away from me. And he and I found each other in a chat room um, through trading markets where Don Miller was trading like the cues on a 10 minute chart because the market was terrible. And we're like, how do we, we got to figure out, you know, canceling is not viable. Um, but he and I got to know each other. And he said, when this thing turns, let's connect and I'll show you how I do things and whatever. Cause he'd already been trading for 15 years or whatever. And it, it, it built, built a great history. And I mean, he's a character, but he, he was so giving and he taught me so much. Uh, we don't trade the same way now because I had to kind of take the core of what he taught me. Um, and then sort of make it my own, which I, which I did. Uh, to sort of fit my personality, my needs, my natures, my ticks, my triggers, all that stuff. Um, and that kind of bore out the system that I have and now teach um, in my service that has allowed me to raise my family and be with my kids and coach their hockey teams and do all that. Because at the end of the day for me, and I'm going to, we'll get into this later about life balance and all of that. Um, but trading is a means to an end for me. Right. Um, I'm, a, I'm a husband and a dad first. That's my favorite job. Um, we will be most successful, I believe, if we understand and keep trading in its proper place. We need to view the market as a tool that we can use to live our lives. But it's, I mean, it's money. And so it fires every last emotional thing inside of us yeah. that creates addiction, that creates these dopamine hits that, and we can get so far off track and, and the market can literally own us. And we can make all the money in the world and have nothing to show for it because we have blown everything else up in our lives. And, you know, for the young people that are out there listening, you have to keep this in perspective and the market is there for you to use when you want to use it. I do not try and maximize how much money I can make every year. I absolutely do not. I never have, I never will. The moments that I move into that psychology, I get myself in trouble. I get myself in trouble. I don't trade as well. I get myself in trouble because my relationships start to suffer because I start to get consumed by how much can I make? And, and it's a, it, I'm just telling you, it's a, it's a dangerous path. 
because it's hard to unwind that and get back to this state of contentment. But I went through several years where I had tons of distractions in my life, mainly my kids. Um, and I think it was one of the great reasons I was so successful was because I had a distraction and I knew what place trading was in my life and I kept it there. My problems started to show up a little bit later in my career when all of us, I'm empty nest now. And it's such a bizarre feeling because um, effectively I'm a stay at home dad. And now I'm a stay at home husband. And my kids are, I, my youngest is, has, has one year left of college and the other three are out and doing their own thing. And my youngest is the most independent of the, of the four anyway. Um, and he's off doing his own thing. And, uh, and so it's, it's just Wheezy and I now. And it's been that way for a few years. And I'm like, okay, well then I guess trading needs to become my identity. And as soon as I started thinking that way, I got in trouble. Yeah. And some things started to creep into my, into my trading game and some problems started to arise that ultimately I think, um, factored into some of my health issues that we can, we can, we can talk about for sure. Uh, as well. So anyway, I just bounced around all kinds of topics that probably checked a few boxes of yours, but um, yeah, that's kind of how I started and, and, and where I went, but I, you know, this is a glorious game, but it can also destroy you if you don't know how to manage it and keep it in its proper place. You don't have to trade every day. You don't have to trade every week. You don't even have to trade every month. You just have to make enough money and seize enough opportunity to be able to fund the life that you want to live, whatever that is. And that's that's my belief and my perspective on how to be most successful as a trader, yeah. especially when you're independent and you're all by yourself and you're sitting here because you know, the isolation can eat you alive. Yeah. So for many, many years, I barely spent time in front of the screens during the day when the market was open. Most of my screen time was at night after stuff had closed. And I am now, I, you know, in now that I'm teaching, I've shifted back to that, um, that philosophy. And I'm trying to impart that philosophy to the, to, to the membership that I have. Use this to live. Don't, <laughs> don't sit here and, 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 and live the screens and live every tick and live the market. It's just, it's not worth it. It, it's going to leave you empty. Use it when you need to use it to live. Perfect. Anyway. Yeah. And uh, I want to dive into, you know, a concept that you've definitely touched on, but I think it's really important. And, and we talked previously, this is really something you want to talk about. Talk about, I want to dive a little bit into, you know, setting the stage about the strategy you use, which is slim based, which I understand, uh, yeah. but also how you've adapted it because you've had to, because you've had to be a full-time trader and, and shorten up your time frame a little bit. So I'd love to hear you talk about that and, and, and how that's impacted you. Um, well, can slim at its, at its core is looking for big winners, monster winners, and they don't come around that often. In 2020, a lot of them came around, but in general, they're more few and far between. And so this, but there's an awful lot of stocks that are in uptrends. Yeah. And so what I started noticing through experience is you buy these breakouts and they come in with volume and all that looks great. And, and you get this two, three, four, five day surge, or you get a two day surge and a quiet pullback and another surge from that point very few of them go on to be monster winners. But most of them, comfortably more than half, when the market is in a healthy condition, give you that explosion move. Yeah. Well, I got bills to pay. And, you know, early on when I was doing this psychologically, it was really destructive for me to get into these trades. All of a sudden I'd get 
eight, 10, 12, 15% into a trade in three days. And I'm like, oh, and then have it come all the way back down to the pivot. That, that loss of paper equity for me, because it's like, I need that. I need that 10%. That's groceries. That's mortgage payment. That's car payment, whatever it is, you, you know? Yeah. I, I can't see that disappear because I don't know if that's coming back again. If it falls down, then you, just, then you, so you go on, you just clip out and you break even. And that's just one of the trades that doesn't work out. Well, that messed me up because I knew I had eight grand in that trade. Yeah. And that eight grand covered my entire month. So I'm like, okay, I gotta, I gotta kind of turn this on its head. And I got to start just taking that because what I'm realizing is that happens a lot. Yeah. The explosion move, I don't know what, you know, call it five to 12%, stay conservative. Happens very frequently when things are set up correctly. Beyond that, maybe not as much. So I just started taking that trade and taking my money. And then I would wait for a pullback. And if it exploded again, I would take that trade. And they would be one, two, three, four, five day trades at most. And after, after two moves, I'd swear off the stock until it based for at least three to six weeks. And if it runs 60%, I just trained myself that that's okay. I let that go because I want the constant, I called it chunking. I want that constant chunk. I'm going to just keep taking that chunk, keep taking that chunk because that's the most reliable part of the move. And then, so, so it's on my list. So, so take like ZM, for example, you know, in 2020, it goes from, you know, 90 to 600 ballpark. I probably got 50 of those points, but I got 50 of those points in probably five different trades where it set up just the way I wanted to and it pivoted and it moved quick for two days. And then I took it and I'm like, good enough, next. And so in a healthy market, I was just moving my money. I, I move it from one stock to the next stock to the next stock that's breaking out and doing these one, two, three, four day moves. And then I'm just taking that. And then I'm waiting for it to reset up and, and you just, kind of keep recycling that money. But as a full-time trader, it became so important to me to constantly be booking profits because I needed for my psychology to know that my bills were paid. Right. And so I had to adapt. I believed in the canceling methodology. It made a ton of sense to me. We're buying fundamentally great growth stocks that are technically triggered, that are set up technically in an uptrending or at least sideways market. Because the cool thing about these stocks is they go even in a sideways market. You don't need a roaring bull. You just need something other than what we're in right now, which most of the time, I mean, these, these harsh bears don't last and they don't come along very often. So sideways markets, great. Hard uptrending markets, great. Hard uptrending markets are actually, to me, trickier because it's you're, you're chasing a lot of shit. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, you, you get really, really sloppy and you get paid to be sloppy, which is the crazy thing. In 2020, there were so many bad habits built by so many people because you got away with being sloppy. But these, the slow grinding trend in the indexes is actually, to me, a great environment because it allows the stock picking to really jump out and you can find some really cool winners in that, in, in, in that setting. Um, so anyway, you know, I had to get real honest about my emotional makeup and we're going to get into that. I had to get real honest about what I needed from trading to maintain the right mindset, to maintain my confidence. Confidence is like this pot of gold when you're trading and confidence is an emotion. And we want to do whatever we can to cultivate confidence in what we're doing. And if that means you've got to go completely against what the traditional norm is or the traditional wisdom is, 
so that you're structuring it to build your own confidence. I need a high win rate. I just, I've learned that about myself. I don't do well three out of 10, even if it's 10 X, you know, I, I, I'm my three or 10 R trades. I'm so chewed up by the seven one R losses in my brain that I'm like over in a corner drooling and, and whatever. And I miss the 10 X and I've learned that about myself. So I need, I'd rather take two and three R trades quickly and continue to build that confidence bank, build that confidence bank. And um, I'm most effective when I'm highly confident. And I think that's going to be true of just about anybody. Yeah. So you got to manage that confidence and you got to tailor your system. Some people have a more stoic nature or they really have full belief in the probability style of it all. And that's cool. And if you've got a side gig or you're managing money and you're getting paid 1%, you've already got your, your, your income covered. And so your performance can be a little bit more like this as you go fine. But as a full-time trader, we, we need a steadier equity curve. And when we don't have a steady equity curve, it messes with our head because all of a sudden we're like, I mean, there's a lot of things that come in. Oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to pay my bills. Oh my gosh, I'm going to let down my family. Oh my gosh, I'm going to look like I'm a fool. This won't work. I need to prove to people that it will work because they think that trading's game. I mean, you got all kinds of stuff that's going on inside your, I mean, and, and it all creeps in and it's all very real. And so I had to create this system that was more short-term in nature. So I've got, like, I've got three different kinds of trades that I take to get specifically into it. I got what I call hit and run trades. It's all off. I do all these scans and whatever on the weekends and, I have a master list of probably a hundred stocks. And then I call that down to about 30 to 35 that are like, okay, these look really ready to go. If some of them are too extended, they don't, they stay off the list. So it's like stocks that I see that are already totally set up or within the next two to three days, if they put in the right kind of bars will be set up. Right. right? Okay. So there's my 30 that I'm focused on for the week. And I don't look outside those names. I just don't. So either my list is good enough or it's not. And if I'm not able to make money off of that list, it means that the list needs to be better or the market sucks. Yeah. It's one or the other. But by and large, over the years, I've tweaked my scans and all of that to make sure that I'm capturing everything. I don't need to catch the big winner. I just need to catch enough moves to pay my bills. And that's literally always been my mindset. So I've got these three trades. The first one, the shortest term one is called a hit and run trade. I stole that term from Jeff Cooper, who's got a book about hit and run trading. And, and, and he was somebody that um, influenced a lot of uh, my trading early on, though he doesn't even know it because I read a lot of his stuff. Um, but I take those trades off the 30 minute chart, the setups on the 30 minute chart. So a lot of times the bases that I'm looking at are only two, three, one day, two day, three day bases, but they consolidate really nicely on the 30 minute chart. And they look exactly like what you want to see on a daily chart. I mean, everything's fractal, right? Like the same setup that I'm looking at on a daily chart that I'm looking for on a daily chart. I'm also looking for on a 30 minute chart. I'm also looking for on a weekly chart. You know, a good setup's a good setup. We all pretty, there's no need to go into what that is because I think that's probably been thoroughly covered over the past four days. Um, but anyway, so I find these setups on the, on the 30 minute chart. And then for specific entry, I dial down to the 10 minute chart and I trade those. And those are typically one to three, three day trades. And a lot of that depends on what's going on in the, in the market, what the environment is, Right now, they are one, maybe two day trades. Because the environment to me is yet to be conducive for multiple day runners. Right. So all we're doing right now is hit and run trades. And most of them, if they're working well, we're taking um, at the end of the day, if we've got good, good profits or you're even taking, you're taking partials along the way because it's important to pay yourself. If it pulls back and it recoils and it sets back up, you take it again, just like CELH, which probably has been talked about some and whatever, and that one's really nice. And 
that's worked out great. They've been perfect hit and run trades. So the second trade I have are the explosion trades, which is probably the bulk of what I have done historically um, in a good market, which are three to 10 day trades. And those are two to six week bases that you find on the chart that coil nicely, that give you that extending triangle, you know, you get the compression and then the explosion. And typically you get three to 10 days. You'll get a couple days move, quiet pullback, second move. Sometimes you just get an inside bar and more move or whatever it is, but they last three to 10 days. And that has been my bread and butter for two decades. Um, the hit and run trades, I started doing more and more during um, correction phases, quiet phases in the market. I, I started noticing more and more with the big caps. Um, you can you can look at charts that are maybe a little less pristine, which is nice because it broadens your base. Um, I, historically, I used to, I, I would never look at a chart below a 200 day moving average. It didn't even, I'm, I'm not, it doesn't even hit my scans, nothing. Well, like right now, like Apple gives great hit and run trades right now off the 30 minute chart. Yeah. Um, and so I've probably got eight or 10 big cap stocks that kind of flow with the indexes that occasionally will give a nice setup. And, and so I'll, I'll, that will be, that'll move off of kind of the canceling stuff to a certain degree, but I'm still primarily focused on those 30 names, but in a healthy market, I'm pretty much only focused on those 30. And most of the trades are going to be explosion trades, which expend, extend out to, from three to 10 days. And then there's the momentum swings, which are, you know, two weeks and longer. I don't do many of those. I'll be the first to admit, I just don't. I don't hold long because I want my money. However, as I'm getting later in life and I don't necessarily need as much trading income to sustain my life, I'm more interested in seeing if I can capture some of those bigger picture moves. So that's going to be kind of my, uh, my next frontier as a trader is moving into what I would call momentum swing trades that last anywhere from like three weeks to three months and capturing the bigger moves, capturing stuff over 20%. Because right. I pretty much take, I mean, I mean, if I got a trade that's got 15 to 20% in it, historically, I just take it and, and wait for that to reset up and move my money somewhere else. I mean, it's like sector rotation. When, when there's a sector theme, it's fabulous because not all the stocks in the sector fire at the same time. Like you look at like, what is it? Managed care right now. There's probably four stocks that look really good. Centene and uh, UNH and there's a couple others. Um, but, and they all kind of have the same setups and some of them are gonna fire faster than others. Um, you get VRTX and UTHR all, it, all both both those are the big biotechs. I think VRTX looks better right now, so that's where my focus is right now. And that's gonna if that takes off, I'll play that one for whatever it can give me, and then I'll cycle, I'll take it out, and then all of a sudden UTH will take off. Because because reality is that sometimes you get in these markets where you got ten setups that fire at the same time, you can't take them all. Right. So you take what you take, you get what you get. You can't sit there and play woulda, shoulda, coulda. You just do your best, see what it yields. And then wait for it all to set up again. So anyway, I'm kind of rambling on, although I think that's probably my job today. Um, yeah, I think that set the stage sets the stage really nicely. So, perfect. but the but the full time trading changes your perspective. Yeah. There are some techniques. Let me let me let me dive into it a little bit since we're on the topic. Some of the strategies that I've used to help manage psychologically full time is it there's there's strategies that i've done to manage being full time and there's strategies that i've done to manage how do you deal with your pot growing because mentally you get to a point where position sizing gets too big and you become psychologically ineffective because you can't mentally you can't push yourself past a certain position size one of the great shifts that i made trading is instead of worrying so much because the profit lines are fairly inconsistent. You don't make the same every month. Some months you don't make anything. Some months you lose. Some months you make big. Some months you just make a little. You got to be a hardcore budgeter. 
And so I go into every single year and it's like, okay, this is kind of what I'm projecting my costs to be for the year. Let's say my cost for the year is a hundred thousand bucks. That's what eight grand, eight eighty two, whatever the math is, 80, 83. I don't know. Call it. We'll just call it 8,500 a month. So I got a $3,000 trading, a three, a $300,000 trading account, for example. I'm just, I'm just making these numbers up. So every month, 8,500 at the first of the month, 8,500 goes out of my account and into my checking account. Whether I make money, lose money, doesn't matter. And so my bills are covered. And that pulls out at the first of the month. And then my my goal at the end of the year is okay. My goal is to have eight hundred to have three hundred thousand in that check in, in that trading account at the end of the at the end of the year or more, versus my expenses. Right. And so, I don't get that edgy if I got a month where I don't make any money, because I know that I'm going to have some months where I'm going to make twenty or thirty thousand dollars, and then some months where I'll make nothing. But by creating that structure, as opposed to, A, I'm going to take all my money out at the beginning of the year for expenses, or I'm going to pay myself as I go with my profits. Now, all of a sudden, you've got, okay, I have to make money this month. That system allowed, at least it allowed me to step away from that process and treat it more like a business, like it was a paycheck. I literally was just, I'm paying myself $8,500 a month to do this job. Right. Um, you know, I remember I started and that was $3,000. And then, and then it grew and then it got big because I got four kids in school and then four kids in college and whatever. And that number really grew. And I was, you know, my accounts had grown because I'd had some, so I'm thankful for the success that I've been able to have. You know, but my position sizing got to where I was like, you know, it got too difficult. And so the second thing that I did was I started opening up multiple trading accounts because I found that there was a sweet spot of size that I could handle psychologically. Yeah. And so instead of having one account where a huge amount of money was going out, I'd have three accounts that were all paying me. $5,000 a month or whatever. And managing those appropriately. And so the numbers never bothered me because for whatever reason, I was able to just look at one account and not get spazzed out by the fact that, you know, if I've got 2000 shares of a $20 stock in this account, and I also have it in that account and I have it in that account, but I just look at this account. Right. And so I stay within myself. And I, I, you know, it's trickery, but sometimes you kind of have to figure out what works for you so that some of your bigger triggers don't show up. Because I was noticing having difficulty if I was carrying eight or 10,000 shares of a position, I became a little dysfunctional. I'm like, oh my God, this is huge. If I'm wrong here, that's going to be X. And that started to creep in and mess with me. So anyway, those are some of the little tricks that I have um, migrated to in my uh, career doing full-time trading. Perfect. Within and, the canceling stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And we were talking about this earlier. Um, I really want to dive into some of the trading mistakes you've made along your career and, and maybe continue to make as well. And some of the demons that have kind of stayed with you because of those mistakes and, and how that continues to impact your trading. So I'd love to hear about that. Okay. Uh, where do you want to start? Uh, probably about, you know, a lot of our viewership is probably a little bit newer to this. So maybe some of the mistakes you made earlier in your career that, okay. that you have I mean, to the fix. big one, and I mentioned yeah. it earlier, the big one that really shaped me early on was the Q Logic trade where I just, I moved outside of my, my system. Yeah. Um, It happened for the same reason, maybe a handful of people are aware of the XIV situation that I had in 2018. And I wanna talk and, about that for sure. Yeah, yeah. we're gonna talk about that. Um, but I, I think most of my big losses 
Um, well, those, there's, there's three big losses that really are etched in my head. The Q-Logic loss, because it changed who I was. I, I've had other big losses, but sometimes it's just, it happens. Um, but the Q-Logic trade early in my career where I just fought the tape because I committed to something that was outside what I had decided was my system. What got me into that? What made me do that? That's a whole nother discussion. I, I remember the day and I took some notes on it because there was nothing else going on in the market except that situation. And so I'm like, oh, I'm a trader, I trade. Yeah. So here's a stock that's got a lot of volume that's moving that whatever. So I'm gonna trade this. And I can't buy it long, it's already up 20%. So I'm gonna start shorting it because it looks like there's probably some, some resistance it's coming into over there. You just start making shit up that you see. Yep. And when a stock's just in a power move off of earnings and it's just getting accumulated and it's just on this slow grind, resistance doesn't matter. You just, you're either looking for a way to get in long or you're just taking your hands off. Um, but I got into it partly out of boredom, partly because it's like, I need to keep making money. I need to keep, I, you know, I can't deal with, and it, it's what started to help create this system of moving money out of my account every single month, because I needed to get off of this train of thinking that I've got to make money every day or every week or every month. Because what I realized is you make your money in chunks during the year. There are three to six week windows that happen on a general year, two, three, maybe four times, maybe four, typically three times where there's this three to six week period where breakout trading really gets paid. And the rest of the year, it doesn't get paid very well. It really doesn't. Um, so I realized that I need to make sure that I'm available and I capitalize on those three to six week windows. And then I need to do whatever I possibly can to stay the hell away from the market the rest of the time. And um, the the hit and run trading kind of evolved to create like to link those, stop gaps yeah. between those periods right? where I could just kind of chunk away, take a little bit, take $500 here, take $500. And it kind of adds up as long as you're thoughtful about what you're doing. And it was psychologically helpful for me because it kept me from having, you know, Sometimes you'd have these three month periods where like this, this time of year, July, August, September, terrible trading months historically. I, if I looked at my career and added up how I did and everything, I'm probably negative for the month of July. Historically over the 25 years, <laughs> it's just not a good month uh, or hasn't been for me. So the hit and run stuff kind of came a little bit later in life as I tried to figure out and just put little put a little bit of consistency in between these moments. But I realized that those moments is all I needed. The three to six weeks was ample, but you'd make a large chunk of money. And it was, it, you know, if you multiplied that chunk of money by three, it was more than what covered my expenses for the year. So I became comfortable with that and realized that that was um, how, it, how it needed to unfold for me. But I was so distracted coaching hockey and, and, and running around with my kids and my three boys played very high level hockey. And so we're traveling all over the country and whatever. And, you know, I'm just kind of, you know, using my phone sitting on the glass or sometimes I'm behind the bench screaming and yelling. And then I'm checking my phone to make sure everything's okay and stuff like that. But um, I kind of lost my train of thought. What, yeah, what talk, were we talking, oh, talking about loss. mistakes? Right. Yeah. So, so Q logic kind of informed that the, the one that taught me about, the cruel nature of, of, of the market was a stock called NQ. Number one IB, IBD top 50 stock at the time. I was really excited about how I entered it. I was probably a little bit bold at the time. I'd been having some success. I probably got myself a little bit bigger than I should. And I'm, I'm, I'm riding this trade up and then boom, I think it was Muddy Waters who came out and said, this thing's a total scam. And it went from 
like twenty six dollars to eight wow. overnight, and you just go whole. Oh. And so that was about a hundred thousand dollar loss. I think I had eight thousand shares, and it was about a hundred, little over a hundred thousand dollar loss. I don't think there's anything I could have done about it. I probably shouldn't have been too big. I probably should have been paying myself along the way. It was kind of a reminder. I forget the year that it was, quite honestly. I want to say 2011, 2012. I could be wrong there. Uh, I'd have to go back and look. Um, I bet Mike Webster could tell me because I know that he remembers that trade too. Um, but that trade really ground in how I needed to make sure that I stayed short term because I'd been in that position for probably three weeks. And I think my average cost was about 18, 19, and it was up around 26. And I'm like, look at me go. And I think it's going to 30 and that nice round number, maybe, you know, and, and the pattern was nice. And then that news came out. And um, so that really, that loss sticks with me. Um, it didn't debilitate me like the Q-Logic trade did. And it didn't debilitate me like the XIV trade that we're going to talk about in a second did. But it educated me to the cruel nature of the market and, and you know, the risk of China stocks, and because that was a that was a Chinese company, and um, some of the j- just some of the things that can actually happen that can catch you off guard, and, and I, obviously it caught lots of people off guard because it was the top stock or one of the top three or something like that in the IBD fifty at the time. So uh, that one really shaped me. Um, and the last one that's probably had the, the greatest shaping on me was the XIV trade that I had. Um, usually, uh, maybe I've worked through it enough. Typically, I can kind of start crying when I talk about it because it has so many different emotions wrapped into it. But um, it was a planned trade. Like I was looking for that bottom in the market reversal in late January. And XIV is something, is a vehicle that I've been kind of messing with and trading around a little bit because it, if the market's going up, it goes up. If the market's going sideways, it goes up. The only time that that thing goes down is when the market goes down, hard. So I kind of figured out a rhythm and it was a little kind of almost like a little day trading strategy on the side that I'd been just ticking away and adding money to the account sort of thing. And so I'd had, it was in January and I'd had, I'd had a halfway decent month, but I could tell that the market was rolling over and then it rolled over and I took my hands off and I said, okay, I'm going to wait for this thing to settle, to, to, to get down to where I think it's finally having one of those capitulation moments. And then I'm going long XIV planned. It was ready for it. Got that day, and I bought, I felt so good about the trade, but that really wasn't why. I bought an absolutely absurd amount of XIV. I had in my brain that I was going to make $150,000 to $200,000 on this trade. I'm like, I'm going to nail this thing. And it was coming towards the close. And I want to say it was around 90. And I'm buying it in thousand shares at a crack. And I buy in 6,000 shares. And then in the aftermarket, just with some little jibs in the first five or 10 minutes of the aftermarket, it kind of drops down into the, into the eighties. That's weird. That's just, that's just, you know, position squaring and stuff. I'm going to buy a couple more thousand. So I get up to like 8,000 shares of this thing and an average cost of, I, it's probably like 88, 88 and a half. Huge position, oh yeah, 700 and some odd thousand dollars. What in the hell am I doing? Um, I mean, my trading account was a lot bigger at that time, but that still was way over half my trading account. 
in one trade. And then I go into the kitchen and I'm hanging out with my wife and I, one of my kids came home or whatever from school and whatever. And then I go back in to kind of just see where it is. And that damn thing's trading in the thirties. And I'm like, what? Something's wrong here. I don't get it. And it just kept dropping and it just kept dropping. And then it got into the, in, into the low twenties. And finally I was just like, I don't know what's going on, but I can't. And I just flipped it all out half a million bucks in an hour gone. And I was like, I didn't know. I was like, I, I just, I just sat there. I was like, numb. Um, came into the condition, came into the kitchen, stared at my wife, and then just started bawling. Just, she's like, what happened? And I explained it to her. And she was like, why'd you have, why, why'd you buy so much? And I go, I, I don't know. I don't know. I know now, but this is the stuff that creeps into our trading. I had, like, see, this is hard. <laughs> uh, can I do it? Can I do it? Yeah. You've probably heard the story. Did you hear the story? You listened? I have, yeah. yeah. But I, I think some people out there haven't. So, I, so if you can, it'd be great. Yeah. My youngest boy uh, in late December tore his ACL for the second time. See if I can pull it off. And we had invested a lot in his future, especially him. And he had a promising hockey future. And that kind of blew it up. And I knew it. And um, like I was depressed. I was devastated as a dad. And the other problem with having a heart attack, which I guess we'll get into at some point too, is that your emotions just go out of control after you have one. So that's where I am right now. Um, we have situations in our life that so devastate us. And what I was doing was I was going to the market and saying, tell me I'm okay. Pay me and tell me everything's going to be all right. That should have been a 2000 share trade maybe 1500 shares still the law still devastating still what in the hell but not a half a million bucks i sold over position and it was driven by my need for the market to tell me that everything was going to be all right i needed a win to balance the scales of of that other stuff um and i think we do that a lot as traders. And it's easy to say, yeah, well, just don't do that. Well, we're humans, man. And we're, we are this complex basket of emotions and our fabric is, is it, it's just, our emotions are, are, are part of the fabric of who we are and our highs and our lows and our experiences and our joys. And I mean, all of that has emotion attached to it that we bring to the screen every day. Yeah. And if we don't learn how to process through that shit and understand the roots of our triggers and our ticks and, and what makes us do things in pressurized moments, we're doomed to repeat it over and over and over and over again. Um, so it's still hard for me to talk about. It was four years ago. And um, I used to have a lot of shame with it, which is not a good emotion to have. Um, 
but I found my peace with it now. But it shaped the living daylights out of me going forward. I mean, I was so scared to take a trade, Richard. It wasn't even funny. I was absolutely paralyzed. And I've been having great success for, you know, 20 plus years. But something about that trade just like so sunk me. Like, what's the point? I thought the market was after. I mean, it was just, you had all kinds of crazy thoughts going into your head. And every single time I sat back down to trade, all I could think about was, I got to get my money back. I got to get my money back, which only led to more losses. And so I quickly realized I got to just stop trading. And I took, I took a week long vacation out to Colorado and went skiing all by myself. And then came back and thought, okay, that's going to refresh me and kind of slowly started to get back into things and started having a little bit of success. And then as soon as I felt like I kind of had a handle on things, I just started sizing up massively because that, that trigger was still there. I got to get my money back. I hadn't accepted the loss yet. Yeah. I hadn't accepted. It. So I stopped again, went back out to Colorado, spent another week. Just breathing through it all and trying to find a way to come to grips with getting back to neutral and accepting that that money is gone. It's not mine anymore. And I'm not getting it back. And this is where I am. And that probably took me another three months before I was ready to kind of stick my toe in the water again. And I, I started doing it by day trading a hundred shares of Apple. And this is kind of where the day trade side of me started to come out because it was all that I could handle. And I, you know, I've watched Apple over the years and whatever, and it's kind of a bellwether and a barometer and it trades great with the futures and all that stuff. And I was literally just, I didn't give a shit. I didn't care. I didn't care if I won. I didn't care if I lost because I was trading a hundred shares. It just wasn't, I mean, I couldn't do how much damage could I do with a hundred shares. And so I had no, no attachment. And I started making hundred bucks a day, 200 bucks a day, 300 bucks a day, just trading a hundred shares, you know, just click, click. Yeah. Look, just mostly on feel like price and volume only with a couple moving averages, nothing else kind of looking at the levels the previous two days and seeing sort of where, where traffic was, you know, in the stock and just click, click, click. And I went a month that way. And I think I made like 2000 bucks in a month trading a hundred shares of Apple. And I go, wow, that's not bad. And then I bumped it for the next month to 200 shares and I did the same thing. But this time it was $4,000. And so I was like, okay. And so for about five months, I just slowly increased my size trading Apple. And then I started looking around to, well, how's AMD trade? How does Nvidia trade, you know, with relating related, because I'm using the futures with all this stuff too and whatever. And so it, but it, it rebuilt me. And you know, the amazing thing, and I tweeted about it in January of 2019, I think it was. It took me a whole year, but I, I made all my money back. And I didn't even realize it because I'd let go of it. And it was that like I was over Christmas, I was like looking at my accounts and whatever and sort of going back and looking at, at the P&L for the year. And I think my P&L was like minus $5,000. And I was like, it just hit me. I was like, oh my God, I did it. Um, but it didn't start until I accepted the loss. And I think, I think a lot of us don't accept our losses. Our, our first reaction is I got to get my money back. Um, and it, and it builds a lot of really destructive habits. So, um, for all of 2019, I was basically a day. I said, okay, I'm going to do this day trade thing. 
It's totally divergent from everything I've done, but I'm so damaged from this trade that I can't do that right now. Um, and I, towards the end of 2019, I started bringing the, my can slim stuff back in addition to it because I had finally rebuilt and I'd gotten myself on better footing and day trading was exhausting. I was feeling it physically. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then 2020 happened. I missed, this is the other thing about if we want to talk about missing bottoms, like I missed the COVID bottom so badly. It wasn't funny. I spent three months going, there's no way that's the bottom. Are we not going to retest that? We always retest the bottom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the cool thing was I didn't really start getting into these stocks until July. And I still had a phenomenal year. I was day trading and I was doing the can slim stuff. And it was probably ended up being, I think it was the second biggest year I've ever had. So my point to you guys that are constantly focused and stressed about finding the bottom and being right there when the bottom occurs, it doesn't matter. Once a good uptrend starts, the opportunities are so strong that if you miss the first month or you miss the first 5% or even the first 10% off of the bottom, it's not a big deal it's okay. There's going to be a lot of stocks breaking out that you can pour yourself into and take advantage of. So that's, um, that's kind of my communication on that. But, um, but the day trading took its toll. Yeah. And that mixed with just life stress. And I'm a pretty intense guy. And um, I was an intense hockey coach. Uh, I wear, you know, I'm a very emotional person. I'm, I'm, you know, emotions are a big part of who I am and you have to, you, you can't, you cannot deny yourself. And that's a whole nother topic. And I really would love to get into it. If we have time, I just don't know how much time we have. Um, I'm looking at the clock and I realize not a lot. Uh, so, I think, I think we've actually, we, we're, we've got lunch after this as well. So we've got about 30 more minutes of normal time and then we can dive into lunch a little bit. Okay, so we, okay, we got plenty well, of time. You know, um, well, I got to leave in about 25 minutes anyway, but that'll, that'll, yeah. that'll work out. So, um, so in 2021, the, the, the trading environment kind of shifted. Wasn't as easy to make money. The breakout stuff wasn't working nearly as well. A lot of the stocks were starting to fail and whatever. And so I kind of backed away from that. And I was just sort of doing my day trading a little bit while the market wasn't nearly as uh, advantageous. And that was great. And that was working, but there was a lot of stress. We were, we were trying to figure out where to move. And the housing market was so tight that we couldn't find anything. And so I had that stress along with the trading stress. And apparently, and I've always been an exerciser and whatever and eat pretty well, but I have also have a, a genetic thing where I don't process cholesterol. I've got something called familial hypocholesteremia. So I don't process cholesterol very well. And that plus 25 years of parenting and trading stress and not keeping things in their proper place caught up to me. And in June of last year, I had a heart attack sitting on my couch. There were plenty of warning signs the three, four months prior to that, that I kept chalking up as panic attacks or anxiety attacks or whatever in my body, but they weren't. They were warning signals that I refused to listen to because, you know, I'm invincible. So I had a heart attack in, uh, in June, June 26th of uh, 2021. So it's just past a year and I feel amazing. Um, I'm on as little medicine as possible, but on medicine to kind of control my cholesterol and, you know, my diet and exercise is great, but I'm very focused on maintaining a low stress life now. Yeah. And balance, right? And balance. Yeah. I always was, but not by design of stress. I just realized that the more I stayed away from the market, the better I was as a trader, the less I worked the better I was. The more I just let stuff do what it was going to do until I got what I needed right. and then got out and was back in cash. I was 100% in cash in strong bull markets a lot, just waiting for the next 
group of setups to come along. And then I'd lean into them. They would move for three or four days. I would take my money and then I would wait. And I was content with that waiting. And it was a good flow and a good rhythm, but I was also content because I, because I had distractions and other priorities in my life that, yeah, I'll look, even though I was a full-time trader, I kept enough other activities in my life. Played golf with friends twice a week, coached two hockey teams, you know, whatever it was that I chose to make sure took priority. And I was very efficient about how I did my work so that it took me an hour and a half on Sunday to do my work and do my scans and get my list made and everything. And, and I knew that I had to keep my focus like that, but it was also part of my power because I kept my focus like that. I looked at 30 stocks and that was it. And I didn't look at a single other stock the entire week. And so if something else was flying, I didn't care. But I think that's something that is, as traders, we need to realize that we have to narrow our focus. And I've tweeted about this a couple of times once recently. And um, the more we narrow our focus to make our decision making super simple, and we stay in our lane of what, what it is that we choose that we are going to be, the better off that we're going to be. And Twitter is an absolute train wreck for this kind of mindset. Because you have a little bit of struggle and all of a sudden you start looking around at what other people are doing. And there's plenty of people out there that are willing to sell you a bill of goods about what they're doing that's absolutely unbelievable and how they're crushing it and all that shit. And it just absolutely drives me crazy. So focus in terms of what it is that you're doing. Like you need one setup that you master and you can make a hell of a living for the rest of your life as a trader. I have one setup basically. I just use it on the 30 minute chart and the daily chart. So on the 30 minute chart, it shows up a lot more frequently on the daily chart, maybe not quite as often in a good market. We get more of them in a bad market, not as much. So I got to lean on the 30 minute chart setup. Sometimes I'll wire down to a 15 or a 10 minute chart if I really want to get after it. Um, but I have one basic setup premise it's real similar to like what 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 Minervini teaches and um you know obviously it's can slim based it's you know based you're finding a consolidation that reduces in volume reduces in volatility and then explodes out of there with expanding volume that stuff happens on a 10 minute chart it happens on a one minute chart if you really want to get down to it you can find that pattern anywhere it repeats over and over and over and over and over again we all look for it. And I've adapted my trading to my lifestyle, my personality, my ticks and triggers, my needs. Um, and, and that's what I teach. And everybody's, I mean, it, it's, there's a ton of freedom in this job if we choose to take it. Um, we haven't really um, explored you know, the, the concept of how important it is for us to be in touch with our emotions. I was going to ask that next. So, yeah, it's, um, I don't want to say it's a touchy subject for me. It's just, it's, I mean, we're such emotional beings. I mean, we attach emotion to all of our experiences in life. We like something or we dislike something. It's an emotion. Trade with confidence. That's an emotion. Don't trade with fear. That's an emotion. And I also disagree with that. You should trade with fear. A little bit of fear is really good. Like if you walk up to the edge of a cliff, I want you to be a little scared. Yeah. I want you to be a little careful. If you don't have fear, you know, bad shit happens too. Um, so fear is actually a good regulator sometimes. It's just excessive fear that you don't want to get consumed by. But, but you have to like look at the emotions that you have that are productive, that move you forward. And look at the emotions that you have that hold you back. And you have to figure out how to diffuse the negative emotions. And a lot of that is, is, is by asking tough, honest questions. Well, why do I feel that way? Like if you've got, if you're about to go into a trade and all of a sudden you're a little hesitant, you're not sure you want to do it. It's fear. 
Why? Like, why do you have fear sometimes entering a trade? Because you're afraid I, of what I, Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm uncertain. Right. Yeah. And, and why does uncertainty a, a cause us to be afraid? What is it? I mean, we're all different. Like, the reasons that it triggers in you is going to be totally different. I'm pointing at you on the screen, and my hand's not even on the screen. I got there. I got to go up here. Um, the reason it triggers in you is totally different than the reason that triggers in me, or, a, or something breaks out and comes back, but it's not at your stop. But all of a sudden you're like, do I, do I, do I front run this and take it? I don't, I, I don't want to go all the way to the stop. I don't want to lose that much. Why? Why do you care? What, what is it that's, what's actually happening inside you that is triggering that fear? If we just say, don't fear or just be objective or play the probabilities or trade without emotions or whatever, it's just, it's, it's, it's such a farce because we're, we are emotional humans. We, our entire existence is filled with emotion. So as traders, we can't deny that side of ourselves. We can't, we have to learn to work with it, figure out how to exploit the stuff that really helps us and diffuse the stuff that doesn't. Otherwise, we're doomed to repeat the same triggers over and over and over because that trigger's not going away unless you figure out what's at the root of the trigger. Like I have a lot of, I'm very competitive with my father. I have a comparison problem with my dad. He's had a lot of success in his life and I'm trying to measure up to that. I'm trying to prove my worth. I'm trying to gain his affirmation. I have it. He loves me immensely. He's super proud of me, but there's something inside my head that says, I got to prove that on my p &L. Why? What do I care for? He already thinks I'm amazing. What seriously? What hangs me up? I, I and, and so you got to dig into that and figure it out. Does it go back to something that happened when you were eight years old? It could. I mean, that's the stuff that we have to figure out because all that stuff kind of comes into us. So we're we're just this basket of complexity and emotions. And for us to disregard that as traders. Because it's very powerful if you can use it the right way. Yeah. Sometimes when I get angry, I'm at my very best as a trader. Um, so it's 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 learning what what puts you in that focused frame of mind that allows you to trade with confidence versus lack of confidence. It, keeps your decision because when you're confident your decision making is faster it's more precise you lean into yourself so how do you stay in that frame of mind what are the types of things that you need to be dwelling on and focusing on to stay in that frame of mind and what's the stuff that chips away at that frame of mind and you need to figure out what that stuff is and dive deep on it so that you can figure out how to let it go because it's all about letting that stuff go um, and the roots are probably a lot deeper than a lot of people realize. So, I mean, Denise Schell talks about this as for 20 years. And um, she's taught me a lot because you, you got to kind of figure out yourself. And I figured out that I needed a lot of winners to stay in a right frame of mind. And so that's how my trading style is sort of. And part of that is just a function of my, my full-time economic needs. Right. Um, so we're all different. It's just a very personal journey. We're all, I mean, if we're all here, you know, we're at the Trader Line Conference. So the bulk of this is people who are all kind of trading more or less the same way within, within a structure. Yeah. We're, you know, we're all looking for the same stocks. We're all, I mean, I don't think any of the names I brought out earlier today were, you know, anything new to anybody that, that at least the presenters. So we're all kind of keyed on the same stuff. But so why do some people fail and one pe some people succeed? Most people fail and few succeed. There's a different component then. It's not the system. It's the human. And that's where exploring your emotions, understanding your emotions, the power of your emotions, positively and negatively, and how to bend that package in your favor so that it becomes an edge is really the trick. And that's, I, you know, that's, that's, I don't have the full answers for that. I'm still exploring that as a trader. Yeah. 
I mean, I'm thankful that I've been able to figure out how to make more money than I've lost, but I've lost a hell of a lot of money in the process. But net net, I've made more than I've lost. So that's that's good. And I'm proud of that. I'm very proud of that. Um, to be able to say that I did this and, and fed my family for 20 years um, means a lot. But I'm shifting now. And um, I'm not going to say I'm retired, but I'm not trading as aggressively as I used to. And I'm now doing more teaching. And I'm really, really enjoying that. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. And t- Tom, do you do any kind of journaling or any, do you have any habits and routines that help you stay in tune with how you're feeling and, and what emotions you're experiencing? Because it is so important to, to recognize that. So what, what do you kind of do to know what you're actually going through? I don't journal. I did when I was early on to kind of understand a little bit more about myself when I would kind of go down these rabbit holes of why do you feel that? Why do you feel that? So I did a lot of journaling with rabbit hole stuff early on that at least sort of gave me, like I sort of knew my markers and my triggers. And I don't really anymore, not, you know, part of it's I'm lazy. Um, because I know it probably would help me, but I do meditate now. And so there's a reflection on a daily basis that helps me tremendously and keeps me a little bit more calm. Um, But I'm not, um, I I think journaling's great, but I'd be lying if I said I still did it. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, what kind of general advice do you have for people out there who, who uh, want to become full-time traders and, and what, what can you tell them so they can know what to expect and know kind of what they'll go through the stress you've talked about? What would you say to people like that? Um, take your time. Number one, um, stay in your job as long as you can possibly stay in it while you continue to build this bank of experience that teaches you about yourself. Just because you've had one year of success, I mean, you've only seen one kind of market. If you've had one year of success, you've seen one kind of market. You you kind of want to, you want to expose yourself to as much as possible in the market and and yourself. And that's when the journaling is key, is is, is at that time, in my opinion, where you're really starting to understand your your, your ticks and your triggers. Secondly, you need to be prepared that when you start trading full-time, you're going to suck. No matter how good you were before you were full-time, odds are you're going to suck for three to six months and you're going to be like, what? So go back to this and remember that Candy told you that it's going to be difficult the first three to six months because you just got all kinds of different emotions that you're going to have to sort through that you didn't have when you had a regular paycheck coming in. So it's just more to be prepared for that. How to process through that, that's on you to figure out. But I'm just saying, know that that's coming and that there is a, there's going to have to be a reckoning that you're going to have to go through for a period of a completely new set of emotions that you didn't have when you were working a full-time job and trading on the side. Yeah. And we already touched on this a little bit. You you mentioned, you mentioned social media and kind of the expectations and and pressures with with that, where everybody seems to be making money, even if you're not, even if you're having struggles, is there anything more that you want to dive into there about, you know, how traders should actually view social media and, and, you know, making sure it's a positive, not a negative. I think you have to be very careful with who you follow on Twitter. Um, I think it's a great platform. I think there's a lot of support that we can give each other. I'd like to see more people who are reaching out and giving that support, talking about the trials, talking about the struggles, because we all have them. We all have them. I still have them. But Twitter makes it look like, A, this job's super easy. B, we crush it every single day. There's information overload that's coming in. Like you follow a few news feeds and a handful of traders and you're like overwhelmed. Um, so you have to sort that out for yourself. Um, like I have lots of friends that I've made on Twitter. I literally mute 85 to 90% of them and they're friends of mine because I just don't want their input coming into me. I don't want it. 
I, I need to, you know, my mantra is be dumb, follow price. I, I, I want to, I want to be like this. And if I know Brian Shannon's looking at something or I know, you know, my buddy, Anthony Crudell, he's liking a certain level in the key in, you know, in, in the NASDAQ futures, I don't want to know about it. I, I, I don't want to know. Um, so I think that Twitter can be an asset, but it can also be an absolute platform of destruction if you invest yourself too much in it, because I, I don't think that uh, a lot of the content has value. Or even if it does have value, it doesn't have value for you. Because you can get a piece of information that's just a news report, but it causes you bias that you're now chewing on that is going to bleed into a trade that you take. You know, I really do believe, I genuinely believe the dumber I am, the better I trade from that standpoint. It makes me super smart with analyzing price and volume, which I think tells everything that needs to be told. Because institutions who have billions and billions of dollars have tons of minions that are out gathering information in every corner of every single company. They're lifting up every single rock. They know it all. And so they have all the information. I don't need to duplicate that effort. I just need to see what they're doing on the screen and follow it. That's our job. See what they're doing on the screen and follow it. They got better information than we have. They have way more information than we have. They have information that won't ever come public until it's way too late. So just follow what they're doing. You can see their money on the screen. So follow that. Um, so Twitter then becomes a little bit of a, of a, of an information overload from that perspective. It can also be the, well, what in the hell's wrong with me? I'm struggling and all these guys are crushing it. What in the hell's wrong with me? Nothing. You're perfectly normal. You're a hundred percent normal. You're struggling and so is everybody else. And the guys that are crushing it are full of shit. Okay. They have problems too. So, uh, you know, I, I have a love hate uh, relationship with Twitter, but it's obviously it's true. You know, I said to you earlier, it's like, I, I, I probably post, I've been tweeting for six years and I probably posted 10 charts in that six year time frame. I, I won't ever chart a, well, you should have done this or look at this thing that I did. What good does that do? How does that help anybody other than, oh, crap, I missed that. That's the more devastating effect. Or it's, I want people to see how cool I am. It's one or the other. Neither one of them are productive. All I do is tweet about the struggle and the emotions, the challenges, the pain of losses. That's 95% of my tweeting. And I just, I keep growing with my following and it tells me that's an issue. That's a, that's, that's striking a chord at the heart of all these traders that are trying to learn and all these trading traders who have been doing it for years that don't, that don't have anybody who's identifying with what they've been feeling for years. Like this silent pain that I talked about in a tweet I did a couple of days ago, this, this quiet desperation because we're doing this all by ourselves. And, and the struggles and the challenges that we go through, it's, it's real and nobody wants to talk about it. So I do. And, you know, some of the responses and some of the stories I get in DMs and whatever, it's, I mean, it's, it lets me know that, you know, when I send out a tweet and, 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 and I get a bunch of responses like, oh, I thought I was the only one, or I'm so thankful that you said that. It makes me feel like I'm not the only one or whatever. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm hitting a chord. And, and a lot of times people just need to know that they're not the only fool in the building that missed that trade. And um, so we can grow and we can strengthen each other that way. Because yeah. I really think FinTwit can be something that, that, is, that is a strength builder for all of us. I mean, I think you guys do a lot of really good stuff that, 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 that encourages. We got to encourage each other. God, this is a hard fucking job. There, there's my one F-bomb for the whole thing. This is a hard fucking job. Super hard. It, it taxes everything. 
that we as humans are. And, and we need each other's support. We got to build each other up, encourage each other, applaud the good stuff, tell them it's okay when bad stuff happens, let them know that they're normal when they're struggling, you know, help. Even if it's just a hug, sometimes that's all somebody needs. Oh, you get it. You get my pain. That's, that's human connection. That's emotions. And it's super important for all of us. So that's where I come from. Yeah. Tom, th thank you. I think we just have time for maybe one or two more questions. I want to make sure okay. to give you time to talk about uh, what you've been doing over at Be Dumb, Follow Price. Uh, is that, does that time work with you? You think two more questions is good? Yeah. Or, I'm supposed yeah. to be somewhere at 1130. Okay. But if I'm 10 minutes late, I'm all right. Cool, cool. Um, so you, you mentioned earlier Denise Schull and, 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 and how she's helped you. I want to ask you for everybody out there kind of looking for resources about addressing the mental side of this and, and your emotions. What have you found really helpful and what's helped you? What books, resources, all that? Um, books wise, not much. Um, uh, I did, I went through counseling for probably six years here in St. Louis um, with a guy who's now a dear friend of mine that probably had had, a, had the biggest impact on me in terms of my trading. And we never once talked about trading. Yeah. Um, Denise is a great friend and we've had various conversations about this because she's such a proponent of, of, of how emotions are very real in all decisions. Yeah. And, and we need to acknowledge them and, and figure out how to use them to our advantage. And she's brilliant with it. Um, and, and she and I just have a great friendship and I really appreciated all the, uh, all the wisdom and advice that she's, she shared with me. Um, but in terms of, of resources, like, like I read Mark Douglas's book, trading in the zone, and there's a lot of really kind of cool stuff in there, but it only goes so far. And it never really touched on what I considered my personal issues because we all bring a lot of who we are outside of trading into our little trading world. And a lot of the conventional wisdom is just leave that out there and just make unemotional decisions. Okay, well, there might be a handful of you know, stoics out there that can do that, but the bulk of us bring our I call them the village of idiots, you know, sometimes. And I, I've, I've said, you, you bring your village of idiots and you stack them up on the desk and you greet them so that you're aware of who they are and, and, and you get to know them and you make sure that they're in plain view. Yeah. So that when you're making decisions, you know, you're making decisions with these things operating on you instead of sometimes if we're, if we're not intentional about, accepting who we are and and the nature of our beast and we're we just kind of sit down because sometimes i get in trouble because i just sit down and just see a pattern and start trading it and i forget to acknowledge all my little friends here that want to destroy me <laughs> um so there's an intentional moment that you have to take in my opinion before you sit down and before you make trading decisions to acknowledge what's going on going on in my life how am i feeling you know check in with yourself i think that's a big big and i've started being much more intentional about having a 10 to 15 minute sort of meditation process first thing in the morning that is really kind of i've just started it since my heart attack and um it, it's been a for me it's been it's been really really affirming and and helpful and it keep it, it i make you know my decisions on a consistent basis are much better. Yeah. So you know, any, any of that type of stuff is really uh, where you're diving into your own self-awareness is going to make you a better trader. Yeah. I, I think the worst few weeks of trading that I've ever done, um, considering the context, it was right during uh, final season, my senior year of, of college. And I don't think I realized how much stress I was under and how much all that stuff factored into my decision-making. And I, I made some bad trades, took some losses that I shouldn't have. Um, 
And yeah, you, you got to be aware of all that stuff. If you're traveling all that, you're not going to be up, up to snuff. That's a great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, we're now traveling a lot more like tomorrow we're heading down to Florida and I've realized I, if I travel the next day, wherever I am, like when we get to Florida or if we come back to St. Louis or, or whatever, I don't trade for a full day because my bearings are off, Yeah, you know, and you know, you're in the middle of finals. You're probably, you, you've got the trading thing. Cause one of the problems we run into is we kind of got, we're in a flow, we get what we do and whatever. And we kind of think we can do it on autopilot. We sort of get this, I'm invincible sense about us. And we think we can take on a lot more than we can. Yeah. Um, and the market shows us exactly where we're at on that. Yeah. yeah. So there is a certain level of respect that we have to have for what the market is capable of versus what we're capable of. And sometimes we underestimate the market and we overestimate ourselves and we create that gap that causes us to get our ass handed to us on a fairly regular basis until we bring that back in balance. Yeah. Tom, just one last question for you. What are some of the key takeaways that you want people watching uh, this discussion to, to, to get from, you know, everything that you've talked about? I know that's a big, big ask, but where's, what is the overarching message and, and theme that you want to bring? Struggles are normal. Um, the more you can get in touch with who you are, whatever that is, be at peace with who you are, find who you are and be at peace with it. Again, back to acceptance. And then build your, your trading around that, finding ways to exploit the things that make you strong and finding ways to diffuse the things that cause you repeatable destructive habits. You got to dig into those. Um, so you got to kind of know your ticks and triggers. Um, I think that's probably the biggest it's personal. You have the freedom to do this however you want to. You don't have to maximize. You don't have to beat last year. All you have to do is make what you need to make to live the life that you want to live. And all of those decisions are completely up to you and nobody else gets to enter into that. And I think we get we get into comparing. We, our, our competitive natures get going. Our comparative natures get going. We want the Lambo. We want the watch. We want the whatever. I get caught up in wanting to buy a house in Colorado. That's a big trigger for me. Right now, that's way more expensive than it used to be. Because I have, I, I built a pot where I've got enough to, to, to live the life that I have right now, but I want that house in Colorado. And so I push. Yeah. And it's like, but why? Let that come naturally, or if it doesn't come, it doesn't come. But we, we, need, to, we need to figure out what our drivers are and are they healthy drivers? You know, so so now now I'm really getting getting going again. Not supposed to do that. Um, but accept who we are and, and keep this thing in its proper place. God, keep it in its proper place so that you can do it for a long time. Because if you let this thing own you, you won't do it very long. You will ultimately blow yourself up or burn yourself out. So if this is something you want to be able to do for the rest of your life, pace, balance, other things in your life have to be more important than trading. Yes, be great at trading, but make sure it's not the number one thing in your life. Yeah, Tom, thank you so much. Uh, I found this really meaningful and I'm sure everybody watching did as well. Awesome. Uh, and I know helpful. it's tough tough to talk about some of this stuff, but I think it's helpful. It is, um, but yeah. I'm, I think it's necessary for us to be able to talk about it. Um, yeah. I, I, think, I think more traders, that are, are learning need to see the struggles that guys have been doing it for 25 years also go through yeah. at various points in their careers. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I just wanted to ask you for anybody who wants to learn more about your system and process, where, where can they find you and, and learn uh, more from you? Freedomfollowprice.com is uh, a new service I started about a month ago. Um, we're actually running a free trial so you can come check it out for seven days and see all the videos and whatever. And, um, I'm teaching my process and, um, there's a summer special that we're going to run until the end of the summer for, for the, you know, the initial people that's, you know, won't ever come along again. And I mean, the feedback's been great, but that's, that's where I'm spending most of my energy right now. Um, 
I, I trade what I what I teach, and so I'm I'm doing it with my members. And uh, so if you're interested in kind of learning how how I view Can Slim and how I do Can Slim, um, and the and the trading style that that has has allowed me to do it full time for the last twenty plus years, um, that's a great place. It's be dumb follow price one word dot com. Um, Come check us out. Perfect. Well, Fun. Tom, thank you so much. And uh, what, what's your Twitter handle as well for anybody who Candy isn't? Or Candy Candy Four. Four. I'll go on rants there every once in a while, as uh, some of you may know. And um, yeah, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, emotions are a big deal, and trading's personal. And 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 I hope people got something out of this uh, to understand more the soft, squishy side of trading that uh, the underbelly so yep. to speak, of, uh, of what we all go through when yeah. we're doing this. Perfect, Tom. Thanks again. And to everybody watching, we'll go on lunch and I'll, I'll be back in just a second to uh, you know share some information. But uh, yeah, we'll be right back. And then at 1 p.m., we've got a niche secret, which you do not want to miss. So uh, thanks again, Tom, and, and we'll be right back. All right. Thanks, Richard.